I've been called feminazi by Rush Limbaugh for many years <laughs> and consider it an honor. <laughs> But it's pretty different now. It's really different now. Now, if we link our knowledge together, we, I think, can come to a better understanding of why this is happening. We know from our insights into family violence, which we finally revealed and told the truth about, and so we understand much better, we understand that the maximum time of danger for a woman who is escaping is just before or after she escapes. It is at the time when she is escaping control. It is all about control. And I believe what's happening now is that this country is escaping control. It is, <laughs> what it means is that um, Many things, you know, we are no longer supporting the war in Iraq and we're questioning the one in Afghanistan. We're questioning our health care system. We're questioning our profiteering financial institutions. Uh, we're questioning patriarchal families and the hierarchy of race and ethnicity. Women of all races have elected leaders to show, to, to slow or stop the long backlash against reproductive freedom as a basic human right. Um, and we have an African-American president and his family in the White House. We will be, <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to you. <laughs> By 2012, we will perhaps no longer be a mainly European-American country, right? Lots of things are, are changing and happening. We've lost our faith in Wall Street. I mean, you know, many things are changing. We are becoming free. And this is a time for us as a country of both maximum danger and maximum promise. So what we have to do is figure out how to protect each other and minimize the danger and look at the nature of it and see how it is connected. There aren't different movements. There is one big movement. There isn't one uh, hierarchy, all different hierarchies. There's one way of hierarchical thinking, which often starts in, in the family. So what can we do? Well, uh, you're doing it. You're doing it in this room. Everything I heard means, means that you're, you're doing it. So I only have a few suggestions for you to, except for, for number, I'll do my own number 25s on the card, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That assault weapon in Arizona really did me in, and I think that the women's movement is the only massive group that's going to take on gun control. Because I, I don't see, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not happening in Congress uh, enough because of the four million votes that the NRA says it has, although they never prove it, but they say they have them. Um, it's the, a lot of the leadership on the left doesn't seem to do it, and it just seems to me that we're the right people because we're the folks that they, they say they're protecting. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we get to say, no, thank you. <laughs> and we get to point out the statistics that say no house is safe, safe with a gun in it because a gun is much more likely to be used against people in the house. And in fact, a gun is much more likely to be used against a woman in the house or to frighten a woman in the house. It's like a hundred times more likely to be used in that way than to use to protect her from the outside. I mean, our, for women, the home is the most dangerous place on earth. So it seems to me that we could put together a, a massive movement, more massive perhaps than Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but of that same kind of populist uh, nature, and that each of us here can take it on in whatever way we can. But we need a slogan, and I, we need lots of slogans, but I would say no house is safe with a gun in it. And we can take that up in whatever way we can. <laughs> code, code pink, code pink is um, 
very enthusiastic about this. I've talked to the Girl Scouts about doing a gun control badge, which they could do at least as an alternate. You know, they also have a sex trafficking badge. It's not your mother's Girl Scouts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big job, but I think that we can do it, and I think we're the right people to do it, right? Uh, now, if you're in any kind of media, new or old, um, I went to a conference of women journalists in, from all over the world in Moscow, and what came out of it, it was so important and so simple in that way that important things are simple, right? Which was, we have to have peace correspondence as well as war correspondence. It, the original governments, the Iroquois Confederates, uh, you know, the folks who were here before the Europeans showed up understood that their systems of governance were entirely devoted to conflict resolution. If we don't report on it, if we don't understand that there have been many truth and reconciliation commissions, not in addition to the one in South Africa, if we don't see it as a complex continuing process, if, if we, all, we get what we pay attention to, if we have war correspondence, we hear about war and we think it's normalized. Um, I think um, if we're teachers or administrators of any sort, a business, wherever, nonprofits, wherever we are, I think we can remember to teach and model the simple truth that cooperation beats competition every time. We've been brainwashed into thinking that competition is part of human nature and even that it produces excellence. Wrong. I recommend to you a book called No Contest, which you may know. It's not a new book, it's a classic book by Alfie Cohn, K-O-H-N, uh, that, that offers up all of the studies and statistics and situations showing that actually competition produces mediocrity and discontent, and uh, co cooperation produces excellence. We all know that we're, we feel smart when people think we're smart, Right? And we feel dumb when people think we're dumb. So what we, that's what we need. We need that kind of support. We don't need a system, a hierarchical system, in which only one can win, wasting the unique talents of all the others and making that winner forever insecure because someone surely will come along and beat him or her. We learn not by placing ourselves with those who are uh, less skilled, but being together with people who are more skilled. There's no incentive to do that if you're only worried about winning. We learn not from sameness, we learn from difference. Difference is a gift. Difference is what allows us to expand and learn. Um, empathy turns out to be the major part of our evolutionary equipment. The species couldn't have survived if we didn't have a, feel a leap of empathy to another human being in, in order to help spontaneously that that human being. It, the Good Samaritans during World War II, who everyone was trying to imitate because they helped Jews at their great own great danger, and they themselves were not Jewish, in, in studying them and trying to replicate them as we would all like to do, the question was, was it education? Was it religion? Uh, what was it? And it turned out to be the most shared factor was they had not been abused as children because w child abuse, I mean, in the sense, the purpose of punitive ways of raising children is to cut off that leap of empathy, to make children feel deeply, grow up believing that there's only two choices, I, either you're the victim or the victimizer. It takes a lot to cut off empathy, but that's what happens with a lot of the way, ways our, our children are, are raised. So if we had even one a uh, generation of children raised without violence and shaming. Just one generation, think what would be possible. We have no idea what, what might be possible. And finally,